Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's um, really, really good to be here to present on one of my favourite subjects, which is um, energy saving in pumping systems. So for those of us who spend much time on industrial sites or even commercial buildings, pumps are one of the biggest sources of energy use in motors. And typically, they'll account for 25% of the energy used by motors. And the really good news as well is that often there are some very simple to spot um, um, ways of saving energy. So I'm hoping that by the end of this seminar, you'll be able to spot a few more of those opportunities. And also, if people are talking to you about possible energy saving opportunities in pumps, you'll be able to have a, you know, an even more um, well-informed discussion with them. Um, like with any subject of this sort of depth, it's unfortunately important to really get to grips with the basics. So during the first half of the presentation, there will be a lot of curves and graphs trying to understand the, the key points, and I hope that's okay. Um, I, and I've been doing motors now for over 20 years, and to begin with, I really, really struggled with pumps, and I couldn't couldn't quite understand it until somebody said to me, well, well the problem to you is that you, you know too much about motors, if you, um, and pumps aren't like motors. Yes, they may be stuck on the same shaft as the motor, but the way we think about pumps, the way we characterize them, is different. And so um, it, if I can suggest that to give those of you who know a lot about motors, it's just for the first half of the talk, you just try to forget about that and just focus on the pumps and how we think about pumps, that, that might be useful. And then later on, we'll bring the, the motor back in, and we can see how it all goes together. Right. And now to the first slide. So what we're going to be looking at is how pumps work on a very simple level, how to interpret pump curves, some of the different types of system curves we see. So that's the system the pump's working in different ways we can control single pumps, and then how we can control multiple pumps. And as we do that, you'll sort of see how we can do some really quite amazing things to, to reduce the energy consumption. And then we'll be looking at pump deterioration as well, which of course is something that we don't see in motors. So the key learning points are that um, we really need to understand the system properly. If we understand the system and what it's trying to do, then that will give us some very good clues as to how we should be controlling it. Um, you've probably heard of variable speed drive being used in pump systems and the power cube law that we'll come on to. And this is absolutely right. Variable speed drive can save a lot of energy. But we just have to be a bit careful that we don't apply them everywhere because they're not the answer to every pumping opportunity. And of course, variable speed drive don't just save energy. They also give us very precise control of parameters such as pressure. Um, one of the nice tricks we can do is to take a pump and put in a slightly smaller impeller. And that way, we end up with a different duty pump at very little cost. So we'll be looking at that. In parallel multiple pump systems, so this is where you've got lots of big pumps in parallel. Um, don't have on more pumps than you need, because you'll see in a few minutes that that really, really does eat up the electricity for little benefit. Do obviously use high efficiency motors, but we do need to just remember that the, because they have reduced slip, they'll run slightly faster. So we need to just bear that in mind. And of course, pumps do eventually wear out. Today's talk is just about pumps for clean water duty. And at the top there, you can see a pump um, on, a, on a skid with a big motor on the other end. And so we'll just be talking about the green bit, the pump on the left-hand end, and that's for clean water. What we won't be looking at today is other types, such as positive dis displacement. Um, we can see at the far left there, there's um, an Archimedes screw pump you might use in some applications a very, very high pressure hydraulic pump. And of course, there's also wastewater pumps as well. It's a generally centrifugal type, but they have to pump all sorts of horrible things, um, as, you, as you can see there. So 
Um, there's not some time to go through those in, in detail today, but the principles are the same. So we can start off with looking at centrifugal pump characteristics. And the best way is to um, become a pump yourself. So if you've got a jug of water to hand, like on the left there, and you can fill it up to within a couple of inches of the top, and then find a wooden spoon and stir it. So you are going to be um, putting mechanical energy to stir the water in the pump. So that will create a, a um, centripetal force. You'll be giving um, velocity energy to the water. And of course, the only way it, it can escape is by going up the edge of the jug. And eventually, when you're turning, when you're, you're stirring it fast enough, the water will start to go over the edge. And you are now a pump, so you are moving from water from one level a couple of inches over the top um, to, down, down to another reservoir. So that, that is basically how a centrifugal pump works. What you will find is you have to stir incredibly fast to actually get that water to go over the edge. Now, a properly engineered pump is on the right there. And you can see the impeller in red. And the water goes in on the suction side, which is in green, and then comes out the top of the pressure side. And what happens is the impeller spins the water around very, very fast, driven usually by a motor. And then the water is thrown out into what's called the volume, which is the, the light blue bit and out the top. So what we know about this is that the amount of water going in it's going to be the same as the amount of water um, going out, but the pressure will be greater going out, which is, after all, what a pump is. So that is very simply, um, and it's simply form what a centrifugal pump is like. And we come straight to these affinity laws, which are the key to understanding how they work. So the first one is Q, the flow, um, is proportional to the speed. So that, that kind of makes sense. So what we're saying is that if we double the speed that we're um, turning the pump, we're going to get double the flow. The next rule isn't quite so odd. It's, it's saying H, which is the head or, or the pressure, is proportional to the speed squared. And if you go into textbooks, this is related to that centripetal force you were putting in, you know, the, the, the V squared component or the kinetic energy, however you want to fix it. So the pressure is proportional to the speed squared. And the power, P, is proportional to the flow times the head. And hence, by combining all of these, we get power is proportional to N cubed. And that's the famous power cube draw. And that applies to wind turbines equally. It applies to pumps as well. So what I want to do, though, is to go and look at what's actually happening on this graph. It's actually very important. We've got a straight line here. And that's we're saying here that the flow is proportional to speed. That makes sense. The power here is going to be proportional to speed cubed which is really good. So you can see with that red arrow, if you could half the speed, then you're going to have an eighth of the power that you did to begin with. So some really big theoretical energy saving. So that's all good. What we do have to watch, now we're coming back to this, is what's happened to the pressure. So the pressure obviously falls as the flow comes down. Now, if you're in a pumping system and you weren't too bothered about the pressure, that's great. But if you did need the pressure, for example, you're pumping up a hill to your reservoir, then losing that pressure or head is bad news, which is why pump affinity laws are great. But if you've got a lot of static heads, you're trying to pump uphill, that's the problem. Right, so we're going to look at the pump data sheet. It's not always easy to get a pump data sheet out of manufacturers, and you'd normally want a lot more than this. But this is the basics you'd, you'd want to see. Now, if we start with the efficiency one, that's the red line, that's kind of what we'd expect for a lot of machinery. So it's got a peak efficiency somewhere to the right there. And that's 
the best efficiency point by definition. And usually that will be at or very close to the design point for the pump. And the design point for the pump is um, where this blue line, the total head, um, intersects with the, the best efficiency point. Now the pump is going to work anywhere along this blue line. So if you're the best efficiency point, that, that's good. But if you were to put a hose on the end of it and to start to squeeze the hose, put your thumb on the end, um, what you find is the flow is going to reduce, but the pressure is going to get higher. That means that we're going to be going left up the curve. We're going to get less and less flow, more and more pressure. So, and if you haven't got a hose, you could have all sorts of other things on the actual pump system. But the pump is going to be constrained, obviously, to work on that blue line. The power here is just a combination of the power, that's the, the flow, the head, and the efficiency. And it will be specified here for, for clean water. If you've got a different sort of fluid, um, then the, um, the, the power will be greater, greater or less. Um, it, at the bottom there, we have a yellow line, which is the MPSH, which I'm not going to talk about today in any detail. Uh, uh, so thank you, thank you DDEC, for the point of that. So here, we, here we have the yellow curve. This is the net positive suction head. And what this is, is if you're, if you're going at very high high flows, then the pressure at the inlet of the pump starts to get low. You can get bubbles. That reduces the efficiency. And when the bubbles burst, you get cavitation. And that starts to erode the pump. And the pump makes a horrible noise. So that's something physical you need to check um, when, you're, when you're actually selecting finally the pump to use. Um, on some data sheets, you'll see additional curves. You'll see not just that, that. You'll see not just the blue one, but you'll perhaps see another one there, which is where you've got a slightly smaller impeller. Um, a pump might be characterised for use with more than one motor speed. So instead of just having that one, you may also have the pump characterised with a pump with a motor of half the speed. And as you can imagine, if you're going half the speed, then you're going to have um, half the flow, but sort of a quarter of the, the head. That's something to watch out for. A um, really important point is that all the data you'll be supplied with, and as I'm talking today, is only for the pump. The motor is something added on later. Okay, so we now know all about centrifugal pumps and how they work. So we're now going to see what happens if we um, start to look at the actual system curve. And this, this is, I think, a really, really important concept. So we're starting here. We've got two pumps. These are the little round green pumps. And the first one is pumping water from a tank here um, to another tank on the roof. So we're saying that's mainly static head. All it's doing is moving water up against gravity. So it's gaining um, potential energy. So that's it's very easy there to see what the pump's doing. This one a bit more interesting. It's pumping water around this very long and curvy system. You've got a lot of friction in the pipes, in the bends, and so on. And the water all comes back to the pump, and then it's pumped around again. So you may say, well, the water hasn't actually gained any energy. So what's going on here? Um, where, where, why, why do we need a pump to do the work? Well, the pump is simply using energy to overcome the frictional head. So there are two sorts of pump systems. There's one that is going to be pushing stuff upwards against gravity, which is you've got a static head, and the other the pump is against friction head. And of course, very often there'll be a combination of the two. But making sure you know what you've got is, is important. So on um, 
so we'll say that we're trying to pump some water up to a top of a cooling tower, we can typically measure the, the, the height distance between the water on the inlet of the pump and the outlet of the pump system, and that is the static head. Then on top of that, there'll be some frictional head as well. And also what the frictional head is saying is that the faster we, we want to move things, the greater the friction. So finding the operating point. So now we're going to bring together what we know about pumps and how they work, and what we now know about pumping systems and what they're about. And as you were probably expecting, the system operating point is where the pump curve, which is this one here, and where the um, actual system curve, which is this one here, intersect. And that is where the pump is going to be working. Right, so we're now going to have a bit more fun. We've got this system that is um, got an operating point here. This is where the red and the blue, blue curves interact. And it's working fine, but we've decided, well, actually, we'd like to have about half the flow. So what we could do is um, put our fingers over the end of the hose, or we could throttle it, the valve, start to close the valve. And what's happened is move back up this curve. And you can see what's happened here. Instead of having the red line, we've now increased the, the, the friction, the pressure drop in the system. And now the head goes up much more quickly as the flow increases. And so by doing that, we've now got a new operating point here. So we've got a bit more pressure, but we've got half our flow. So we're happy. And that would work. What we could do instead would be a bit more smart is to put on a very good speed drive to reduce the speed of the pump. And what that would do is, is instead of having this gray line here, we will now have a green line pump because we've slowed it right down. And you, know, you go back to those pump affinity laws. So we've now got reduced flow. So what's so clever about that? Why is it better to reduce the flow by reducing the speed rather than throttling? And it's down to energy. What we said earlier is that the energy is proportional to the head times the flow. So we throttle the energy of that rectangle. If we put on a variable speed drive, the energy is that rectangle. So you can see that in this case, by putting on a variable speed drive, we've got our flow down and we've reduced the energy used by about two thirds. And that is why in variable speed drives to reduce flow are really good. And this is a, a, a curve that just sort of emphasizes that. Obviously, if we're going to throttle stuff, we will save energy. But putting on what's called here a frequency inverter saves a lot more. And the point is you don't have to reduce the flow by much to be into the big saving zone. So some of you may be thinking, well, it's all very well. But what happens to the pump if we, if we reduce the speed? Um, obviously, the head will come down a lot, which is good. The efficiency of the pump will fall a little bit, but the loss of efficiency will be much less than what we're saving um, on the power. You see there the power shooting down. So from, for most systems, you really don't have to worry about the actual pump performance itself. Now, this is a really, really important curve. Um, and it's just distinguished again between static head and friction head. So if we've got, um, if we're on this, this curve here, which is all friction, we can keep reducing the speed, M1, 2, M3, M4, M5, M6. We can reduce it as low as we like. Um, and we still have an operating point. If we're on this system, which has got a static head, if we go down to M4, we've got an operating point. If we went down to M5, reduce it even further. We've got a problem because our pump reducing less pressure than the system needs to work. So we then have 
a non-pumping situation, it won't work. So what it's saying very clearly is that if you've got you know, any considerable static head, think very carefully about actually using a variable speed drive because it may not work. And sadly, you do see systems like this in the industry. So people have put variable speed drive in because it could fail them have sold them, and it's the wrong thing to do. Another thing you can do, um, it, it doesn't see it very often because it's, um, it's, there's no going back. This is your pump here as you bought it. This is it with a smaller impeller. You've got a bit less head. And you can see as you come down, um, the efficiency maybe just falls a little bit, but the power can fall quite, um, quite a lot. And to, um, to, to begin with, you're just trimming a small amount. The amount that you save on the system energy consumption, it can be much more than what you lose on the efficiency. So you can do this. Um, I, I won't go into any more detail now. Um, the problem is once you've trimmed your impeller and put in a smaller one, it can be hard to go back to a bigger impeller. So um, that's, that's basically on single pumps. I just want to um, show you what you can do on big systems. Um, I see this sort of system in petrochemical sites, steel industry, really big energy users where they have big heating and big cooling demand. So and this is um, a steel slab cooler. So you have lots and lots of water being produced by pumps, probably several hundred kilowatts each. And the water then treated, filtered. It will be go to cooling towers and then round again. And what happens this is if there's a problem, people put on another pump to get a bit more water. And maybe the problem is fixed, maybe it's not. But people are reluctant to turn the final pump off because maybe it will stop the system working again. Um, all right. But what hap um, it's really interesting to see what happens when you put on more pumps. So we're going to start here. This is our system. And this is our one pump. And this is our operating point. So you can see how much head and flow we're getting. We don't think, oh, we want a bit more water. We put on another pump. Um, but because of the shape of the system curve, you see we've now got two pumps on. We're getting quite a lot more pressure, but we're not getting a whole lot more water. Well, still, what's happening is the flow is going to be shared between the pumps. So the pumps are now working well to the left of their best efficiency point. So that's bad. Um, and the power by, used by each of the pumps has actually gone down, but the total energy it's going to go up. You can just see what's happening there. And if you put on a third pump or a fourth pump, the situation is only going to get worse. You know, they're going to, the pump is going to go far to the left of their best efficiency point. Um, so this is, if you see lots of pumps in parallel, do make some inquiries to what's going on, because often there are some really good opportunities for turning some of those pumps off. Um, very often, people don't even know what's the target um, temperature drop they're trying to get. So they don't really have much of a chance of getting the, the optimum number of pumps. Um, in that system, there are, you always find there are non-return valves. And you have to do that because otherwise the pump that isn't, isn't working could have the water going backwards through it. And obviously, that's not going to be, be very good. Um, we're now going to dig out all our motor knowledge again. And we're now finally going to stick the motor onto the pump to drive it. Um, for smaller pumps, you'll, um, you'll just be given something off the shelf. For bigger pumps, you will be given a choice of motor. Um, so that's the standard sort of pump and motor that we think of. This is a much smaller one. This pump doesn't even have its own bearings. It relies on the motor bearings. This one has a built-in table speed drive, and that, that's, that's quite a nice way of saving energy. But in very briefly, in terms of motor selection, you'll all be familiar with these curves. Essentially, when you're, you're selecting a motor, you've got to make sure it's always going to have more torque available than is required by, in this case, the pump. 
and then we see some operating point, uh, you know, should really be up there. And that's where the motor and the pump will be operating there. Um, and because we're generally using asynchronous motors, it will be slightly lower than the synchronous nominal speed of the pump and the motor. Um, obviously, we want to be using high efficiency motors. Well, you do get a problem if these high efficiency motors will have less slip, so they run a bit faster. And you know, what we now know is that if the pump's running faster, then the power's going to go up. That will depend very much on the shape of the system curve. So it's worse on an all friction load. Um, so this is a real thing. You know, if you just swap out an all a less efficient motor and put in a new one, then you could find it's using more power. Obviously, by a new pump set, that's all taken account of. If your pump set is properly controlled, so you're pumping stuff up to a reservoir and it switches off, that's going to be pretty good. If you've got a variable speed drive on it, it, it doesn't care what the um, speed of the motor is. So that is something to watch, but it's not, it's not a, a big concern if, if, you're, if you've got a properly controlled system. A really, really good variable speed drive opportunity is in circulation systems and buildings for um, either cooling or heating. And these are all friction systems. And they'll be running for most of the time, most of the year, like today, it's fairly mild, just at a very low flow. Only occasionally do you need lots of hot water or lots of cold water. And so for lots of the time, they can run at very low speeds. So that's, that is a really good energy saving opportunity. Um, another opportunity is if you've got very, very big motors, hundreds of kilowatts, on a batch process like this, where you really want to turn the pump on and off every two minutes, but you can't because the motor will, will just trip out if you're turning it on and off that often. A variable speed drive will, of course, let you to just ramp the motor up and down very gently. Um, without saving lots of energy, but without um, destroying the motor. So that can be a nice thing to do as well. Um, they actually drive, they don't just save energy. Um, they can also give you, in this case, much tighter pressure control. So you can have a variable speed drive, driving a, a pump a lot of the time, um, backwards and forwards, um, rather than just occasionally um, Turning, turning a pump on and off. One of the interesting things about this is it makes the point very clearly that in a real pumping system, there's not just one operating point. The pump will be working over several different operating points. So that has implications for your choice of pump. And finally, we're just going to be looking at pump wear. Um, Unlike motors, pumps do wear out, especially if they're somewhere like a steel works and where there's lots of glitch around. So the efficiency will gradually deteriorate. You can refurbish them, um, and you get nearly to where you were to begin with. Then, of course, the efficiency falls off. Um, and it's a matter of how often you want to do that. Being if for a lot of small pumps, you just throw them out. Um, or you keep, maybe keep motor and put on a new um, pump itself. And finally, um, this is a very, very interesting slide that I'm not going to go into in detail, but it's just making the point that in terms of reliability, you want your pump to be operating as close to its best efficiency point as it, as it can. Otherwise, horrible things start to happen. So the key points, um, start by um, wanting to have a really good understanding of system and of um, also how pumps work. And from that, you can select the best method of control. Variable speed drives are a really good way of saving energy, but not so good if you're trying to pump a lot of water uphill. Then the high static head reduces the saving potential. Variable speed drives can also give you very good control of pressure. Um, don't forget the trick of putting in a smaller impeller. In multiple pump systems, um, it, it's so often you know you can turn off you know two or three really big multi hundred kilowatt motors and still have sufficient cooling water. 
So that's, for me, it's always what I head for on the industrial side, the big cooling systems. High efficiency motors are obviously really good, but we do just need to be a bit careful how we use them, particularly on those systems which are um, that mainly frictional. And pumps do wear out, and so they should be repaired or replaced if they're needed. Um, so finally, in terms of further reading, because today has been um, a very condensed version of a course that can take, well, quite a long time. Um, Okay, um, further reading, uh, Europump do a very interesting set of guides on pump issues, which is worth reading. I haven't talked today about what makes for a more efficient pump, but there's a good guide here that you can, evade, you can get for free just by Googling it. And if you want a textbook on centrifugal pumps, my favorite one is this by Karasik and Maguire, which is rather good. So thank you for listening. Um, thank you. So I'll hand it back to you, Yvette.